Well, good morning, New Day. Welcome to the kickoff of our brand new teaching series called Parenting Like God. What a task we have been called to in raising children, amen? Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff, as you can see on that video. None of us wants to raise the next demon seed offspring of Satan, and so we are doing a parenting series at New Day over the next month. And we're calling it Parenting Like God for this reason. Many people in our culture, even Christian ones, they're parenting like culture says they ought to parent. They're not parenting like Christ says. They're not parenting like God says. They're parenting like culture says. Other people, they have a favorite non-Christian parenting guru, and they are parenting their kids like this guru says. Not like God says, but like the guru says. There's other people, though they call themselves followers of Christ, they're parenting their kids according to an an earthly model, maybe the one their parents set, whether or not their parents set a good example for them. So they're parenting according to an earthly model, not by a heavenly one. This series is called Parenting Like God, meaning parenting like God says, because we want to teach you the way God says we ought to parent, which is revealed in his scriptures, In this series, like God says, not like culture, not like the guru, not like the earthly model, we want to do it like the heavenly model says we ought to. Hey, isn't it true that slowly but surely, whether we want to or not, and whether it's for good or bad, isn't it true that we slowly but surely turn into our parents? Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Anyone want to stand up and give a testimony? Just kidding, okay. No, it's true. I have so found that to be true in my life. And it's okay because I had and have wonderful parents who have set a great example for me. But like, I am literally turning into my parents. Uh, my dad was super passionate about what he did for work and I, I've, I have found that to be true for me. I'm just really passionate about what I do. My dad loved what he did for work and man, I just found a job that I love what I do for work. My dad had a great work ethic. I had the opportunity and privilege to work with him over the summers, and I learned that awesome work ethic. Growing up, my mom would teach us tackle a project a little bit at a time. We were never told, go to your room and be there all day on Saturday until your room is clean. Instead, she would say, pick up three things each day until your room is clean. And in that way, she taught us to tackle a project a little bit at a time. So right now, I'm kind of doing a little home renovation, and I'm not trying to tackle it all in one Saturday. I'm saying to my wife, I'm just going to do it a little bit at a time, which is code for I will never do it, but that's a different sermon. (laughs) Growing up, my mom never wasted food. She still doesn't to this day. The average American household wastes 40% of their food. My mom doesn't even waste 4% or 0.4% of her food. Now, I never really like caught on to that, but something happened over the last year. Don't ask me what it is. It's just that we slowly but surely turned into our parents. Over the last year, I'm like, you better not throw away those four peas. I will eat those for lunch tomorrow. Thank you very much, you know? And I'm just like, oh my goodness, what happened? I am my mother. Now, it's not that we only follow our parents' example when it comes to big things. It's almost uncanny how we even turn into our parents' concerning like strange things, uncanny things. I know my dad at social gatherings, he prefers the floor to chairs, okay? And I have just adopted that. I will be out at a place where I definitely shouldn't be laying on the floor, but I'm sitting there in the chair and I'm just like, I can't sit here anymore. And I'll just go on the floor. It's weird. I know it, but I can't help it. Like, I just have started to do that same thing. Growing up, my dad would buy these certain boots, and they're a really good quality. I think he's literally had them for like 30-something years, you know, like different pairs. But like each pair lasts like 10 to 15 years. And uh, last year, I was like, I need a pair of boots. I just started looking online, and I'm like, oh, that pair right there, I love those. And I went and bought them. It was only after I bought them that I realized these are the Red Wing brand of boots, and that these boots I had grown up seeing my dad wear for all these years, they are also Red Wing boots. For years, my dad drove an old, beat-up pickup truck, okay? Didn't mean to do it. Not trying to copy my dad, but, like, that's the pickup truck he drove. I swear to you, mine is almost a spitting image of this vehicle. It really is uncanny. Speaking of cars, growing up, my mom would say that a car is simply something that gets you from point A to point B. I'm like, yeah, but, Mom, if someone said, I will pay for your car, I will also pay for the insurance, and every week they paid for your gas, what would you get? 
She's like, maybe a Honda Accord, I don't know, something really practical that has good gas mileage. And I'm like, ah! But she would say, a car just gets you from point A to point B. Well, not too long ago, my kids were like, Dad, why don't you buy this car? And I'm like, kids, uh, a car is just to get you from point A to point B. And I, I just, like, you ever caught yourself saying something that your parents said to you? Like, we slowly but surely turn into our parents. And again, for me, that is a wonderful, wonderful thing because I had and I have such wonderful parents, okay? But for some of us, when we think of turning into our parents, it could be a scary thought, okay? If that's the case for you, uh, today's sermon is going to help. But here's the deal. I'm turning into my parents. You're turning into yours. You say, no, I'm not. They're not even alive. What does that have to do with anything? The older you get, the longer you live, the more you will turn into them, uh, statistically speaking anyway, whether they're alive or not. I want to give you a biblical example of this because this is not just true in my life and in yours. This is also true uh, in the life of people in Scripture. For example, when God called a man named Abraham to leave Ur of the Chaldeans in the east and to head west to the land of Canaan, when he got there, he was fearful that the people of the land We're going to kill him on account that his wife was really beautiful. And so he said to his wife, I know what a beautiful woman you are. When the Egyptians see you, they're going to say, this is my wife. And then they're going to kill me, but they're going to let you live. So here's what to do. Say that you're my sister so that I'll be treated well for your sake and my life will be spared because of you. So you'll see in your notes that when Abraham met the king of the region, Abraham lied to King Abimelech saying she is my sister. Now, Abraham has many wonderful character qualities, but the dude was a liar. And this was not without effect. Guess what happened years later when Abraham's son, Isaac, was traveling throughout the same area. Isaac is traveling, and he says to his wife, I am concerned that I will be killed on account of your beauty. Apparently, they had really good genes in that family because everywhere these guys went, they were afraid that someone was going to kill them because their spouse uh, was so beautiful. Side note, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but every now and then I'll drop Kristen off at Stop and Shop, and I'll say, honey, the people of Stop and Shop, on account of your beauty, may try to kill me because of you. (laughs) So please, if anyone asks, say that you are my sister. I digress. The point is this. Isaac meets Abimelech, and as you'll see in your notes, take a look. Isaac, like his father, lied to King Abimelech, saying, of his wife, she is my sister. So Abraham lied, and Isaac, his son, did too. In other words, Isaac found it uh, difficult not to imitate the example that was set before him in his childhood for better or for worse. Now, let me be clear. We are not destined to become our parents. Some of you are nervous right now because you didn't have a great example uh, set before you growing up. I'm not saying you're doomed and tied to the the fate of whatever your parents were like. You're going to be, some of you have been trying so hard not to become the bad example that your parents set. And I don't want you to feel discouraged that you're tied uh, to that fate. What I'm talking about today is the tendency that we have Okay, not the guarantee, but the tendency that we have, for better or for worse, to slowly but surely turn into our parents. Because this is true, because we often do turn into our parents, if you're taking notes, because this is true, one of the first pieces of parenting advice that God gives us in the Bible relates to the importance of setting a good example. Your fill in the blank is example for our children. We got to set a good example for our children. Take a look. This is the clear teaching of Scripture. We're going to be camping out in Deuteronomy chapter 6 today uh, and the next three weeks to come. This is our primary text. God says to the Israelites, they had left Egypt. They're on their way to the land of Canaan, the promised land. God gives them his laws and rules that should govern their lives on the way. And here's what he says of these commands. He says, these commands that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and your gates. I've entitled my sermon today, Live It. 
Because God says in one of the first pieces of parenting advice found in all of Scripture that the first thing we need to do in order to have a positive influence on our children is we need to live it. That is, we need to live the Christian life in front of them. We have to show them through our example what the Christian life looks like. We have to model Jesus with skin on for our kids. Now, none of us are going to do this perfect, but that is the goal. That's what these verses are teaching. Now, fortunately for us, these verses don't just say what to do. You need to live it in front of your kids. They also explain to us specifically how to go about setting the good example that we ought to show to our kids. So I'm going to start uh, going through these. But right before I do, right before I give you the three ways that we can follow in order to set a good example to our kids, I want to be clear that though this is a parenting series... It doesn't matter if your kids are out of the house, there's application for you. As you're going to learn towards the end of the sermon, your job actually gets harder uh, when that happens, and I'll explain why in just a little bit. Some of you say, I don't have any kids, and I don't ever plan to have kids. Well, that doesn't matter either. The sermon has application for you. Others of you say, I am a kid. What has this got for me? You're going to see as we go through. So yes, I'm speaking to parents, but know this up front. Don't tune out. The sermon in the series has application for everyone. So with that said, here we go. Here's the three things we can do that will equip us and enable us to be in a position to set a a model and an example, a role model for our kids. Number one, we've got to saturate our minds with the word of God. In Deuteronomy 6.6, 6, God commands Israelite moms and dads, these commandments I give to you today, they're to be upon your heart. Now, I have to explain something. Originally, these words were written to Hebrews who lived in a Hebrew culture. And we have to understand that if we're to properly understand this verse. Here's why. Today, in English, the heart speaks of our emotions. But in Hebrew, when speaking of the heart, we're dealing not with emotions, rather with the intellect. And you've got to know that to understand this command. So when God says, these commandments that I'm giving to you, they need to be upon your heart, he's talking about your mind, your intellect, your thoughts. So what he's saying is, I'm about to give you a bunch of commands that ought to govern and rule your life, and you are to read them and study them and memorize them and meditate upon them because I want these laws to govern every aspect of your life. There's a great example of someone who saturated his mind with the word of God, and it's the author of Psalm 119. He wrote a very long psalm, 169 verses in total. Let me just share with you a select number of those verses. Here's what the author said. Take a look at the slide coming on the screen. He wrote in verse 11, I have hidden your word, God, in my heart. Verse 13, with my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. Verse 15, I will study your commandments. Verse 94, I have sought out your precepts. And in verse 159, God, you can see from all my study how much I love your precepts. Now, I want to point out this wasn't a pastor. This was a parent. This was just someone who studied God's word, that God's word might saturate his mind. Now, you better believe that this dad, in every situation, at least had the opportunity to go ahead and do what God required as to set a good example for his kids. Why? Because he had taken the time to saturate his mind with the word of God. Setting an example for our kids is something that we need to do, but how many of you understand it's impossible to go ahead and set a good example if you don't even know what God's word requires of you in every situation. So God says, saturate your mind with his word. Now, if Psalm 119 does not describe you, you're not studying his commands, you're not meditating upon his precepts, you don't love the law of God, here's some practical application in some practical next steps you might want to take. Number one, maybe you want to download the Bible app. 
and pick a reading plan. This can take you through the whole Bible year after year that your mind might be saturated with the Word of God. Or maybe you need to create a free um, right now media account. If you attend our church, this is free. It's something that we offer uh, for you. We pay for it. You can benefit from it. Right now media is basically the Christian version of Netflix. Instead of, uh, but instead of entertaining shows, it gives you educational videos on a series of different topics, including the topic of parenting. Or maybe you need to download a free app like I have on my phone, TWFT. This will take you through the verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter, expository preaching of the now late uh, Pastor Chuck Smith. I remember as a teenager, this is how I really, truly started learning the Word of God. I had a gifted Bible teacher take me through it verse-by-verse, chapter-by-chapter, Book by book. So, uh, him or someone like him, maybe you need to do that so you can start saturating your mind with the Word of God. Okay, number two, you need to surrender your will to the Word of God. Saturating your mind with the Word of God is one side of the coin, but surrendering your will to the revealed will of God uh, found in His Word is the other side of the coin. This is what God was getting at when he commanded in Deuteronomy 6, verses 8 and 9, that the Israelites tie his word on their hands, bind his word on their foreheads, and write his, door, write his word on the door frames of their home and on the gates. Let me explain this. Again, this was writing to Hebrews. And as you'll see on the slide, in Hebrew writing, the hand represents our actions, The forehead represents our thoughts. The door frames of our house represents our family. And the gates represent our work. Homes back then typically did not have fences around them. So we're not dealing with a white picket fence around your pretty house. We're dealing with the gates that surrounded the city. And if you read the Old Testament, you'll quickly realize that the city gates, that's where business transactions took place. You read of people taking off a sandal, handling it to you know, one guy, and that was a way that they could seal the deal, taking off your sandal, giving it to the other person. These things happened at the city gates, okay? So what God is saying then in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 8 through 9 is, I want my word, I want my laws, I want my precepts, I want my commands to infiltrate and influence every part of your life, your thoughts, your actions, how you run your family, how you conduct business. And God gives this command because he understands how children work. More is caught than taught. Hey, if there's a discrepancy between what you say in what you do, which do your kids follow, what you say or what you do? They do what you do. Some parents tell their kids, do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> Sorry, they're never going to do it. They're going to do as you do, which is why it's so important that we saturate our minds with the word of God. But then having saturated our minds with the word of God, It's so important that we then surrender our will to the word of God in our thinking, in our actions, in the home, in that work. Because as our kids see us living in accordance with God's word and they see us living out God's ways, though we're not going to set a perfect example, no parent ever does, we can influence our kids for God because they're seeing the godly example that we set. Now, some of you are saying, okay, it said to, you know, our our thoughts and our actions and and in the family and at work. Why our thoughts? What's the deal with that? My kids don't see my thoughts. No one sees my thoughts. That's actually not true. Jesus said it this way in Matthew chapter 12, verse 34. Out of the overflow of the heart, which now we understand, we know in Hebrew, that means the mind. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, the things that we think about in in our heart or in our mind eventually manifest in our lives through our actions and through our words. What is it? Proverbs 23, 7 that says this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What we think about 
manifests itself eventually in our lives through word and through deed. So God says, even surrender your thoughts to my will, which is revealed in my word, because what you think about will eventually come out, and whatever comes out, you want to be a good, positive example for your kids, not a negative one. Friends, when we come to God's word each day, we learn what it says in terms of how we should think. We learn what it says in terms of how we should act. We learn what it says in terms of, uh, you know, how we should behave in a number of different situations. God desires that we would approach his word each day with this disposition. God, I don't even know what I'm about to read today. I'm not sure what you're going to require of me as revealed through your word today. But God, I'm just telling you right up front that whatever I come across, my answer to you is yes. You know, I once told the Lord, God, whatever it takes to advance the mission of New Day, I want to make disciples. I want to mark disciples. I want to mature disciples. God, that's what I'm giving my life to. So Lord, I don't know what you're ever going to ask of me or require of me to advance your mission through the local church, but God, I'm just going to dedicate my life to that. Yeah, well, then at a certain point, it looked like we were going to need to raise money to build a building. And I had always kind of had a dream in my heart that someone would give a million dollars and we would just have it in the bank. And when the time came to build a building, we would just write a check and then tell you all, hey, we bought a building. Isn't this great? And God just didn't provide that way for this building. And I was out in prayer at Ashley Reservoir, just just praying to God, Lord, we are getting kicked out of the Hall of Fame. Not that they were being mean to us. It's just that... They were doing renovations, and we were going to need to leave. And I'm like, Lord, there ain't a million-dollar check that anyone has written. We don't don't have that in the bank. What is going on? And I started sensing that God was leading me to do a capital campaign here at the church and to raise money to build this building. And, oh, my goodness, it was so difficult for me. I was just like, I don't want to raise money. I don't want to talk to people about money other than what is appropriate to do here and there through the sermon series, which we will do from time to time. We're not afraid to talk about it. We just don't like to overdo it here at New Day. And I was like, oh, Lord, I'm going to have to talking about that a lot. I just don't want to do it. And God didn't speak to me out loud, but I just felt this impression on my heart. Hey, didn't you once commit to doing whatever was required to advance the mission of this church and to make disciples? And I'm like, yes, Lord, absolutely. But what does that have to do with anything? And again, I just felt this quick impression in my heart. What if raising capital was the most productive thing you could do in this particular season to make disciples and advance our mission? Didn't you tell me your answer was already yes? And I was like, oh, this stinks so much. (laughs) But with God's help, I was able to surrender that to to the Lord. So do you see what surrender looks like? It's like, you might not even want to do it. God, this is how I'm supposed to think. God, this is how the family's supposed to work. God, this is how I'm supposed to treat my wife. God, I have to be honest at work all the time. I have to be honest, Lord, even when I'm doing my taxes, really, you know, and you just kind of, you come across something and you might say, God, I don't really want to do it. But Lord, I know that if I'm to influence my child for Christ and if I'm to honor you with the way that I live, I need to not just saturate my mind with what you expect. Once I learn what you expect, I need to surrender my will to it. The more and more we surrender our will to the Lordship of Christ, what naturally happens is we set a better and better example for our kids, thus influencing them positively for the Lord. So number one, saturate your mind with the word of God. Number two, surrender your will to the word of God. And now number three, it's important to station reminders of the word of God all throughout your life. Though God's instruction to tie and to bind and to write has a uh, figurative application, it also has a literal application. Like figuratively, we're to let God's word instruct us in our thoughts and our actions and our family and that work. So there's a figurative application to God's command in Deuteronomy 6 verses 8 through 9. But there's also a literal application. He talks about tying his word to your hands, binding it to your forehead, you know, putting it on the doorposts of your house and putting it on the gates. There's a literal application as well as a figurative and metaphorical application. And literally, many people apply this verse by, have you ever driven by someone's house and they have those little white, you know, things in their yard and there's a scripture on it, whoever believes Jesus is the son of God, you know, and all that. 
They're doing that because of Deuteronomy 6. If you come to my house, you'll see on the entrance, Joshua 24, 15, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If you head to one of the staff's house in their kitchen, you'll see love is patient and love is kind because this mom and this dad want their kid to know what love actually looks like. But friends, we need to station reminders because we're human. No matter how much we saturate our mind with the word of God, we're human, so we forget. Hence the need to station reminders of what God expects of us in every situation. Um, In my office, which is right over there, upstairs, I have an ant. It's a cast iron ant, and it's on my desk. A while back, we did a teaching series called Animal Planet, and I taught from Proverbs chapter 6 how the ant works in summer doing what it knows it's going to be happy it did come winter. And I did a whole sermon on that. It's online if you're ever interested. Well, during that series, a wonderful couple in our church, Eric and Sue, they went to some fair, and they saw this cast iron ant, and so they bought it for me, and they gave it to me, and I was like, This is awesome, and I put it on my desk, and it has stayed there every day since. Why? Because it's a reminder. A reminder of what? Well, as the ant does in summer what it knows it will be happy it did come winter, in the same way I want to be like the ant, doing now here on earth what I know I will be happy about up in heaven. And for me, it's just this beautiful reminder on a daily basis to do now what will be most important that I'll have done later. I probably could have worded that better, but I think you got the point. I remember as a teenager, my dad posted this super appropriate verse because he had three teenagers with raging hormones. And so my dad posted Psalm 101 verse 3 onto the television, and it said, I will set before my eye no vile thing. And, you know, looking back, I'm like, Dad, that was a very appropriate verse to post. At least for me, I don't know about my siblings, but at least for me it was. But it was a reminder of what God expected of us, even when we're watching TV and entertaining ourselves. I remember my wife once posted 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 4 on an index card, and she posted it uh, to the mirror at a place we lived at years ago. It said, your beauty should not come. The idea is merely from outward adornment, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. How many of you remember the sermon Andrew preached? He said that um, when he was driving, uh, I don't know that he was driving like Jesus would have drove, and so his wife (laughs) gave him an index card, (laughs) and it said about being patient and kind or something to that extent, and she posted that scripture verse there uh, in his car, and in the sermon not too long back, he shared how how he, he stationed a reminder in his car, stationed a reminder in his car. You can station a reminder on your TV. You can station a reminder at your office desk. You can station a reminder on the wall in your kitchen or over the doorway when you leave your house. Maybe you put it somewhere else. I mean, just wherever's appropriate for you to put it, God says, you're human. Though you saturate your mind with my word every day, you're human and you're gonna forget. So put reminders Station reminders everywhere you go. One of my staff told me that uh, their kid is scared at night, and so they posted 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, and they posted that to the uh, bedpost. And at night when they say, I'm scared, they just go right to that reminder that's been stationed there, and they read that and bring comfort and peace to their child. I could go on and on with examples, but I think you get the idea. Friends, if you want to influence your kids from God, I'm not saying that it's easy, but it's not difficult to understand at least how to do it. God says, hey, you need to live it. You need to teach it. You need to illustrate it, and you need to reinforce it. Those are the four topics for this four-week series. Today, we've talked about the importance of living it in front of our kids, The importance of setting a good example because for better or worse, our kids slowly will turn into us in the same way that we slowly but surely have a tendency to turn 
into our parents. How do we set a good example for our kids? It's quite simple. We do it by saturating our minds with the word of God. We do it by surrendering our will to the word of God. And we do it by stationing reminders all over the place of the word of God. Now, this is not in your notes, but I don't want you to tune out just yet, okay? I have five minutes and 45 seconds left of this sermon, and I got something to say. Listen, this is not in your notes, but in all seriousness, this is so, so important. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. Deuteronomy 6 assumes that parents are with their kids a lot. When it says, when you rise in the morning and and when you lie down at night, that means all day long. It's called mirrorism. And by mentioning the start and the end, it covers everything in between. When it says to model and teach the faith at home and as you walk about, in other words, when you're at home and when you're out and about even running errands, the idea is by mentioning two opposite ends of the spectrum, it's mirrorism. It covers everything in between. So what parents are instructed to do quite literally here in Deuteronomy 6 is this. We're to model and teach our kids the Christian faith all the time, everywhere we go. So so it's implicit here in the text that we are with our kids a lot. Now this presents a real challenge to the average American family's way of life. Most Americans, they send their kids off to school, they're away for six hours, maybe more, then after school they've got sports for two or three hours, then maybe they're a part of some special traveling team and they're gone for 40 games a season or whatever the case might be. And what happens? Practically speaking, they see their kids maybe three times a week at dinner for maybe 15 minutes if they're lucky. During dinner, everyone's on one of these doing this and doing that. No one's really talking. There's really no modeling or, or setting any kind of example for the kids. And then we wonder why they're not passionately serving Jesus the way that we had hoped. I'm not saying it's impossible to raise godly kids in our American culture. Of course not. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying We've got our work cut out for us because of the way American life works. And I think a great application question for parents today is this. Am I being more influenced in how I raise my kids by culture or by Christ? Culture says the only thing that's important is advancing in your career and earning more money. And many Christians even justify living their lives this way, saying, I'm just doing what I need to do to provide for my kids everything that I think they need. Let me tell you, on the authority of God's word, kids don't need more stuff. They need your example. I mean, if your goal is to raise them into materialistic, selfish Americans, then yes, they need more stuff. But if your end goal is God's end goal, which is that they would be raised to fear and honor and revere and serve the Lord, what they need is not more toys. They they need your example. You don't need more money. What you need is to model the Christian life. So question, are they around you enough to see you and your spouse budgeting? Because they need to learn about money, right? And how to handle it in a Christian way. Did they see you writing the tithe check in person or online? Did they see you doing this with the every dollar budgeting software on your smartphone? Do you let them help sometimes even? Do your kids see you doing your quiet time? Our kids wake up every day. Kristen and I have tons of faults, but one thing we kind of got right, every day they wake up and they come downstairs and they see us and we're in bed, we're reading our Bibles. We are far from perfect. My kids are here in the service. They can stand up and give a testimony, okay? Far, far, far from perfect. But we are trying, with God's help, to set an example. Do they see you fight? I know some parents are like, here is our philosophy. We are going to hide and go in a corner, and we're going to whisper, yell at each other because we never want our kids to see us fighting. Why not? One day, they're going to be in a fight with their spouse, and they're never going to have seen how you do it. And they're never going to know how to properly, in a godly Christian way, resolve the argument by each person saying, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Okay? We, we, do, we fight in front of our kids. And then we try to apologize in front of our kids so that they can learn how Christians resolve conflict. Do you see what I'm saying? The text implies that parents are with their children a lot. Culture says, be at work more. God says, be with your children more. Are we going to let us be influenced mostly by how culture says we ought to parent our kids? Or are we going to be influenced more by 
how God says we ought to raise our kids. Now, I said in the beginning of the sermon that even if your kids are grown up and out of the house, I said that there's still application in this sermon for you. Before we close in prayer, let me just address that briefly. You might not have kids in your home anymore, but let me tell you, parents, parents of grown children, you still have incredible influence with your children. The, it's more important that you set a godly example now than ever before. Here's why. Because you've kind of earned the right to speak into their life by raising them, even if you didn't do a perfect job. In what way does my job get harder once my kids get out of the house? Because now you've got to set a good example for your kids and your grandkids. How many of you know children is usually the natural byproduct of marriage? So your kids get married, they grow up, they have kids. Now you, now you got to be a model for even more people than when you only had your kids. So your job gets harder, not easier. So do you see how this has application for you even if your kids are grown? You say, I am a kid. How does this have application for me? It's really simple. You have friends, don't you? You are to set an example of the Christian life for your friends the same way your parents are to set an example for you. You might not have children of your own yet, so, so, so young adults, young singles, I don't have any kids. How does this apply to me? You might not have kids in your sphere of influence, but you have someone in your sphere of influence, and you need to live the Christian life out in front of them and set an example for them so that they can see, practically speaking, what the Christian life looks like, and in this way, you can influence them. So though we're in a parenting series, all I'm saying, in week one here, live it. Next week, teach it. Next week, illustrate it. Next week, reinforce it. It has application for everyone every single week, so I hope you'll continue to come out. But today, step one, God says you want to influence your kids for Christ. You want to influence the next generation for Christ. You want to influence your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your non-safe family members. You got to live it. Set an example. Show them what it looks like. This is easy to understand and very hard to do. And that's why we're going to end our time together today by going to God in prayer, asking for his help. Would you join me? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us instruction in every area of life that's practical and that we can understand. Thank you, God, for showing us how to raise our kids. Thank you for showing us how to influence our friends and our neighbors and our family, our nieces and our nephews and whoever you've placed in your life. We do it by setting an example. God, it's easy to understand. It's hard to do. So we're coming to you in prayer today, asking for your help. Empower us to do what we don't have the ability to do in our own strength. God, if we could do it in our own strength, we would already be a perfect model for everyone. But Lord, we readily confess today that we're not. So we're asking for the power of your Holy Spirit to be alive and well within us, helping us to do what we can't do on our own. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus, who died on the cross for us. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Mike. What an awesome message. We're going to ask that the ushers make their way forward. We're going to prepare to receive the offering. And I'm just going to ask you, if you don't mind staying seated, we're going to formally dismiss you in just a minute. But before we receive the offering and before we dismiss you, I don't know about you, but when Mike said that word about surrender, did you hear that part? And he said, it's our job to say yes even before we know what the question is. Man, when that comes to me in my life, I rarely say yes before I know what's on the line. <laughs> and if I'm going to say yes before I even know what you're asking, you better believe I trust you like, whoa. But when you think about it and you think about God, God of the universe who created you too, and if he asks you, he could just say, I'm God. It's your job to do it. But what I love about the God of the Bible that we serve is that's not how it goes. You see, the Bible says that that God of the universe who did create the universe and did create you, knit you in your mother's womb, the Bible says that he is love. That we don't even know love apart from God being love itself. And you say, what are you talking about, Andrew? What are you talking about? I'm talking about this. When God asks you for that yes before you even know what you're supposed to do, he already gave you a yes when you didn't deserve it. The Bible teaches that when you were in your sin, apart from God, he decided to send his son Jesus in your place for your sins to die. You see, God gave a yes before you or I ever deserved it. And he said, I'm going to pay for you. I'm going to show you my love so clear 
that when I ask you to say yes before I even tell you what's coming, it's going to be so much easier for you to take that step. You see, before you can parent like God, before you can follow after God, you got to remember where you were before he sent his son for you. And if you've never accepted what God did through Jesus, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, so that you could have peace with God, but not only that, so you could actually live this life of faith. You see, God gave us a gift. He so loved you that he gave his own son. So that you and I now, if we place our faith in him, we can live for him. Not just in eternity, but in our day-to-day life. Hey, parents, in your day-to-day parenting life, God can be with you. Thanks for listening to this podcast. To learn more about our church, visit newdaychurch.cc. If you've been blessed by what you learned and would like to support our ministry, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift online at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving.